and welcome to today's parent where we provide you with information and connect you with experts to make your parenting journey a bit more easier on today's show we are talking about favorism favorism in the family we could be doing it subconsciously as parents and on today's episode it's about understanding what forms of favorism are in the family and how we can mitigate that in studio today i have esther Mbao, a counseling psychologist esther welcome to the show thank you christine today's topic i know is a bit heavy yes and for parents for many parents out there me and you being parents as well it's something we cannot come out openly and even think that and even say that we are doing it or even think that we are doing it yes but i know it's a possibility for a parent to have you know to have certain you know i don't know if it's more love towards one sibling or inclination towards one child yes. over another child and subconsciously sometimes you do that sometimes consciously and sometimes doing consciously it. yes what is favorism um favorism um is basically about preferential treatment against another so when it comes to parental favorism this is where one parent or both parents um perceived or actually give preferential treatment to one child or uh particular children against the other children. So some of the children are actually feeling I'm not being treated equally or I'm not being treated as well as so and so. So in a nutshell, that is what I would say favorism is. It's just basically treating some, uh, one of the children a bit better than the other, than child, the other, the other child. child. Yes, and this could be uh, consciously or unconsciously. Right. It could be perceived or it could actually be, be real. real. You know, yes. because you know, growing up, is the way you perceive how you are raised. Yes. And when you sit down with your mother or your father, they, they can't figure out where you are coming from. Yes. Because they feel they treated you equally. Equally, yes. But I always say, whatever you feel, that is what matters. Yes. So I think it's just how it's a matter of perception, it's a matter of perspective. Yes. But I mean, in the family, we have to respect everybody's feeling. Yes. And see where, understand where they're coming from. That's very, very true. But you also need to look at, um, sometimes fairism may not actually be there. A five-year-old wants to be treated like the 15-year-old who has some more freedom than the five-year-old. Of course. So the five-year-old is actually feeling, my mom and dad are favoring my, my older sibling. But that's right. not true. So that's why I said it could be perceived or it could be, it real. Could be real. Or you could find the five-year-old and maybe a seven-year-old. Um, the seven-year-old is feeling the five-year-old is being treated better because they are the baby, you know? Yeah. And the seven-year-old is feeling mom and dad are not treating me like so-and-so. Right. So it, 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 it really looks, it comes from a place of how do I perceive where I'm at in relation to my siblings. Right. And sometimes it could actually be true and real, especially in adult life, you know? You go home and so and so is being treated well because they've been named after this family right so sometimes favorism can also go beyond our mom and dad who are our parents in africa we say even our uncles our aunts are our parents right so sometimes parental favorism extends to the extended family so let's list them what are the forms of favorism in the family okay um i'll give the forms as i give examples coming from an intellectual place You'll find um, someone who's excelling better than another being treated better than the other. And sometimes it could be real or perceived because this person has done so well. So over the holidays, they're told, enjoy your holidays. You know, relax a bit more and unwind. But the one who hasn't done so well is being told, you didn't do as well as so and so. So comparison actually is a major cause of favorism. Right. Yes. So because this other person is being told you need to work extra hard or you need to put in more effort, they actually being they feel their sibling is being favored more than they yeah. are. Yes. But sometimes it could actually be conscious, you know? And you're telling this other child, you know, I don't do one, two, three for you because you don't do so well as your brother or sister. And that's articulated. Yes. Yes. There are people who are, who've actually been told, um, I won't take you out for lunch or I won't take you to the movies because you are not number one like your brother or and sister. And you need to spend extra time studying. Yes. Or you go and tell them, even much later, you tell them, I want to go to this university. And you're told, but you don't do so well as your brother and sister. So why should we take you there? You know, you do what, uh, what, go, do what you can do with, with what we are giving you. And that brings in some favorism. Right. Favorism also comes in terms of gender. Gender. Boys versus girls. Right. We're in Africa. There are families that still follow African culture to the letter. 
There are cultures that say boys should never be seen in the kitchen and girls should always be in the kitchen and do all the house chores. We're in the 21st century. So there is that girl child has been empowered. Yeah. There's education. And the boy also wants to learn some basic life skills because in, each, um, in this day and age, not everyone leaves their home to go and get married immediately. True. So they need this life skill. And because they're being told culture says boys do this and girls do this. Or boys it are brings, taken to school yes, and girls are not taken to school. True. So the girls feel the boys are being favored at their expense. So gender can also be an issue. Also looking at gender, we're in Africa. Sadly to say, there are people who still value boys more than girls. girls. So like you've said, the boys will be taken to school, the girls will be told... You get ready, you know, at some point you will leave need us. To you need to be we like, We'll actually exchange you for cows. So you actually start being treated unconsciously like the cow, you know. So sometimes just the gender factor can bring in favorism. Right. And it's because of the context we're in. So we need to understand that culture also plays a big role when it comes to favorism. Favorism can also come because of sibling position. Like I said, the firstborn and the, the last born. order. Yes. The firstborn are usually treated stricter and harsher. I think the parents are usually trying to test their discipline and punishment <laughs> levels <laughs> with the firstborn. Right. But with the lastborn, you find they've relaxed, especially if it's like the fourth or fifth child. You know, they're like, we, we've used all our, our power, all our energy on the others. So you'll find the lastborn getting away with things the firstborn could never get away got, with. Never used to get away with. Yes. So the firstborn will say, Hey, you're favoring this child. You know, you're spoiling this child. When, if it, when it was me, you never used to do one, two, three, four. So that can also um, bring in some favorism. The last born could also feel, like I said earlier, the first born is being treated better because they have more privileges given their age, right. given um, what they are doing at that point in time. And this last born, naturally, they, they're trying to catch up with the first born. That happens biologically. You know, they're like, oh, my, this is my brother. He's doing this. I also want to do it. But because of the age, they're not allowed to do that. So they end up feeling this favorism in the, in the family. The middle child also, not uh, to be left behind, is wondering, where am I in all this? You know? Yeah. So it seems like this one is being given more attention. This one is being spoiled. Where am I at? So they try to fight for their space. Because there's a theory uh, that goes... The first child, the first bones, yes. are highly favored. Yes. The last bones get the most affection from the parents. Uh -huh. And the middle children are literally almost nowhere. And you see, sometimes favorism comes from nature. Just the way you've said the birth order. Sometimes it's also just a cause could be just nature. But if we are aware of it, we are able to control it or take it to a minimal level. But right. you cannot do away with favorism completely, given that it comes from someone's perception. Yes. You know, going into the next segment of what we want to do, I would want you to meet a very special guest of mine. Her name is Carol. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we want to look into the impact of favorism in the family. Mm -hmm. Because then people go through it as children, mm -hmm. but we never think about the impact it has wow. in our adult lives. Yes. So this is something I want us to discuss. Mm -hmm. But first we're going to hear her story yeah. and then we can take it up from there. Okay. So Carol, growing up, in what instances do you feel that your siblings were favored over you? Number one, I was not allowed to choose the school that I liked. I was not allowed to choose the course that I loved. And also, I was not involved with family matters. I was not allowed to contribute anything, so I was isolated. So I couldn't be able to, to know if I'm light and if I'm long. Yes. Right. And looking back, the impact that it has had on your life, especially now you being an adult, what effect has favorism, what you experienced, what has it done to your life? What impact has it had on your life? Okay. Um, looking at what I went through, it led to depression, which actually led to, I almost actually committed suicide. So at some point you were depressed? Yes, I was. I couldn't say it to anyone, but inside me I felt like I need to do, I just need to finish this life. Because I couldn't even have time to talk to someone. So as somebody who's gone through, in your opinion, has gone through sibling favorism, mm -hmm. 
what advice can you give to a parent out there? Maybe they could be possibly doing something that, you know, that could be pointing towards favorism. What pointers can you give as somebody who's gone through it? What pointers can you give to parents out there? Okay, for parents out there, sometimes I think they do it out of anger. Because myself, like my family, we didn't have that family thing. I didn't know what is love. I just thought... Like you guys didn't have family. a bond. We didn't have a bond. We end that family issues and everything. So I thought maybe my, my mom was bringing it to me. She didn't have anywhere else to take the anchor. So she could bring it to me. And that's why I think it affected the relationship between me and, and my mom. mom. Carol, as you are concluding on your story, what can you tell parents out there? To all the parents out there, I would advise them, please don't, don't discriminate your children or don't treat your child better than the other because of their weaknesses or because of their strength, because it will affect their growth. We are going to take a short break. We'll be right back after this. So Esther, having listened to Carol's story, mm -hmm. what do you think? Um, I think I've picked up two main pointers. One, favorism occurs when um, we, so as parents, we don't know it's taking place. So the child is being affected. They are feeling um, they're not being treated equally. And this, you can see, it has a long-term long effect. Number two, as parents, and we're in Africa, we like to do this. We like to dress our kids the same. We like to take them to the same school. We like them to do the same things. Yet these are two different personalities. So we need to parent our children as they are, not as a group but as individuals. And this will actually um, lessen the favorism that we um, are, are, um, affected consciously and um, unconsciously. Right. Yeah. If I was a parent, I'm just sitting here thinking for the parents, the older parents who are sit at, at home were listening to us, mm -hmm. when they listen to the stories from their children who then say, Dad, Mom, I feel that, you know, you favored my brother, my sister over me. Yeah. And they can't understand where where you are coming from. True. Because in their opinion, they feel that they did their best. Yes. And then coming from possibly their own backgrounds. Yes. Of how they were raised, how they look at things, because then it was about parenting, it was about food, shelter. You know, I yes. give you the basic needs. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's any way you can speak up for the parents as well before we bring in the consequences of favorism. Uh, like I keep saying, parents never go to school to become parents. We actually pick a lot from our own uh, families of origin, how we were parented. And then along the way, we pick up our own lessons uh, um, as life is happening. Right. So as parents, we do our best. And I don't want any parent to feel guilty that they've not done their best. You have actually done your best. But now that you know better, please do better. So don't feel bad about what you have been doing before or what has happened before. Right. The other thing, we're in a culture where in Africa, parents are always right. You know, in Africa, you cannot say your parent does you wrong. No, they are the right and they are the law. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they are not perfect. They're just parents. They're human. So it is how we approach it and how we communicate it to them that really matters. Because you can say the same thing and it will be accepted or not accepted. It's just the mood and how you did it and when you did it. So we need to be very deliberate about how we communicate some of the pitfalls that happen yeah. as our parents are parenting us. Would you advise, if I'm somebody who feels that my siblings were favored over me, if I can approach, let me use the word approach my parents and have a conversation and tell them, look, 10, 15, 34, 62 years ago, this is what you did. Mm. And this is what you made me feel. And I don't want to use the word confrontation. Yes. But I don't know what your take is on that. If you want to get closure, you know, just let it out of your system. Yes. Would you advise for somebody to have a conversation with their parent? Yes. Um, I, w I would say yes and no. It depends with the circumstances. It depends with who your parents are. Because okay. let's be very honest, <laughs> their parents you can still never go back to. Like, but that doesn't mean... <laughs> Uh -huh. After everything I did, I did for, you, for you, you know, how can you be so ungrateful? Do you know how much I saved to take you yes. to school? Yes, but there's a parent who will mellow and be like, kindly, 
kindly just share what you know how it was for me being your parent. Right. So you need to understand your parent. You need to understand their personality. You need to understand their temperaments. You need to understand the context in which they're parenting you from. You know, we're in Africa. Sometimes things are so tough. You don't want to be that parent. But because life is being so tough, so you just end up being that sort of parent. So for you to get closure, you don't necessarily have to go to your parents, but it does help. But you need to be careful. Will this mend our relationship? Now that they're getting older and I'm getting older, and we're also having generations coming after us, right. after us, will this bring healing or, or will it bring a drift? Right. So I won't put a blanket yes or no. But you also need to know if you don't bring closure to it, it has impact on you. Here and now, even as you're watching this, it has an impact on you. And it is affecting you whether you know it or you don't know it. But we usually say in counseling and in psychology, our unconscious is very powerful, that it drives some of the things we do every day that we are not aware of. You know, sometimes you, you do something and you're like, why do I always keep doing what I'm doing? Because the, this uh, and what happened to you a while back is actually a driving force. Right. So maybe we need to look at the impact we and look, look at, at some at of the, the things. Yeah, For sure. Yeah. So let's go and list, uh, list them one by one. Yeah. As a professional, as a counseling psychologist, what's the effect of favorism? Okay. In the family. I look at it first in three tires. It first has an impact on the person who feels they've, they've, been, um, they've not been treated um, equally or right or respected. So it has an impact on the individual. It has an impact on the immediate family. It has an impact on the extended family. And it has an impact on generations to come. Right. It also has an impact on this person and in the society generally and with their other relationships. So with this person as an individual, the self-esteem is affected. So definitely self-esteem issues. Self-esteem issues because become... you're wondering, I don't, or I'm not good enough. That's why my parents never treated me like so and so. Um, I never measure up because I wasn't treated as so and so. Yeah. So your self-esteem, you're always questioning your worth. And you're always questioning your own abilities. Yet, people out there could be looking at you and wondering, man, you've you're got so it figured it out, you know? You're such a brilliant individual. Yeah, but internally you have this battle of, I am never good enough. So you're always striving to be better, to be bigger. Overcompensating. Yes. That could actually be an, a, 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 um, an impact of sibling favorism. That I'm always trying to overcompensate for, not feeling good enough. Right. Or sometimes, I just don't care. I'm never good enough, so I'll what's never do it. What's the point of trying? Yeah, what's the point of trying I to be the best I person I could be? You know, my parents thought I'm not good enough, so will the world ever think I'm good enough? No. So self-esteem has a big impact on who you are in your day-to-day -day life, right. in your dreams, in your goals, in the achievements, in the person you can actually become. Apart from self-esteem, there's a general feeling of rejection because if my parents weren't treating me like others, you know, I was rejected. So you're always feeling rejected. And even when you go to places people are accepting you, you've already rejected yourself. So finding acceptance and accepting that acceptance can be a tall order for you. Right. So this can also lead to depression. Because from the, from the act itself, you're angry. You know, first you're angry. You're like, why am I being treated like this? Yeah. So there's a general feeling of anger. And if you don't deal with the anger, it goes to resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness and all this negative energy That's around you. Live. You know, it's so sad that as a person, the impact of you feeling your, someone was being favored over you can carry you through life and it actually limits you and holds you back from being an amazing person. Or it makes you be super amazing because you're trying to compensate. Wow. To the family, there's the uh, cutting links because you're feeling this person is more important than, that, than me. You, the relationship with this person is affected. Your relationship with your parents because you feel they didn't protect you is affected. affected. Your relationship with your other siblings because why are they not also fighting for me? Why are they not speaking up? Or they also, you know, or are they cahoots with my parents and with my siblings? Right. So the family tie, where you should go back to even later in life and you know I'm in a safe zone. It's you don't have that. For you. So even your own foundation as a person in life Shaky. has been shaken. Shaky. Yeah. So your relationship with your family is tremendously affected. And that's why if you can go back and have this conversation. Right. And people listen to understand not listen to respond, 
it can bring tremendous healing. And this healing, if it doesn't take place, can affect generations. Because when you have children, you're not so comfortable taking them home or taking them to your siblings yeah. to hang out with their cousins. You can imagine that energy in so, that family. Yeah, so gen for generations, people are hurting because of one act or uh, something that happened that you didn't resolve as a family or even as an individual. If you're not able to deal with it with the family, you can go through a process of just letting go. Saying, you know what, this thing won't hold me. It won't tie me down for life. So deal with it as an individual. Deal with it as an individual. Forgive, 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 and yes. let it go. Yes, and you can actually be the one to let it go and start building the bridges in your family. Be the one who says, you know what, it happened to me, but I'll also be the source of healing in this family. How wonderful that would be. Yes. So you can deal with that as well. Relationships with other people, like we've said, your foundation is shaky, your self-esteem is down. So let's talk about the intimate relationship. Someone is trying to court you into maybe marriage. They are telling you you're beautiful and you're thinking, hmm, beautiful where? Yeah. What are you seeing? Yeah. You know, my foundation is shaky. Affirmed. Yes, you were never affirmed. Or even if you were affirmed, it was um, washed away by what happened. So this person is trying to build a relationship with you. Your, re your primary relationships are an issue. This will definitely be an issue. All those things you're carrying from, from that relationship, you carry to other relationships. Right. So you can actually see it has an effect even, a ripple effect, so to say, in your other relationships. So you need to be very careful that if you're feeling um, at some point there was a parental favorism, how do I start dealing with it? How do I start moving away from that? Sometimes we actually say you've been living in that act that maybe 20 years have happened. You've been the walking dead. Life Holding has happened. That one thing that happens yes. to you, based on your perception, so many you beautiful totally things. Yeah, so many beautiful things have happened in your life, but you can't see them because you've been stuck back there in your past. You need to let go of that past, come to the present, and start creating a future that you want. How do you let go? Wow, that's a process for, and that's a, another whole talk show conversation right. of how do you let go. But just first acknowledging. It's very powerful. And you may not acknowledge it to that person, but acknowledging it to yourself and also acknowledging it in a safe space where you can acknowledge the feelings and let them out. I like that Carol said she feels relieved because she's talked about it. Just talking about it starts the healing process. But beyond that, we look at, okay, so this person did this. How will we let go? So there are different techniques we use in, in, in psychology and right. in therapy to help you start letting go and to move forward. So this is something if somebody has gone through, it is something that you can seek professional help yes. and see just how to find, you know, closure and all that. Yes, you can seek professional help. There are those who also feel professional help is not for them. Yep. It is still also okay. Yeah. Find your way, but find the right healing. Please, if you don't find the right healing, that's why we go into depression. That's why we go into drugs and substance abuse. That's why we go into mental illness. Right. Because you've been carrying so much for too long, your body can't handle it anymore. Right. So you start coping with it in very unhealthy ways, and it also takes you now to a place of moving from mental health to being mentally ill. So Esther, as you're winding up, as a generation, as a generation of um, the new parents that we are. Yes. Having gone through, you know, our parents have done what they've done. Yes. And of course, they try their very best. Issues of the past, we find a way to, you know, just let them go. Yeah. You said it very well that when we know better, we, we can do, do better. better. Yes. So that now that we know better. Yes. Tips you can share with parents out there on just how to mitigate, how to mitigate favorism. Favorism. The top tips you can yes. share with them. First, deal with your own issues that you carried from your family. That is very important. Dealing with your inner self. Because if you don't deal with your inner self, you release it on other people. So as a parent? As a parent or? As, a par so as, as an as a individual. Parent. Right. First as an individual. Because being a parent is a role. Very so well put. who are you taking into that role? You need to this be very person. clear. This person. Is this person whole and complete? Or does this person have issues from their own family that he's now bringing into their current family? Apart from that, now that you know we are all different personalities, please parent your children as individuals. There's that blanket parenting, but you need to take it further and treat them as individuals. Treat each other as they are. Take them as they are. They all have their different giftings. They're all equal. It's just that they all have different abilities. So take them as they are. But more importantly in today's parenting, listen more and talk less. Listen more. 
and, and listen talk yes less. and listen to understand don't listen to respond that would be my key take out listen more when you listen your children can come and tell you actually when you did one two three i felt feel. you you treated this person better than me and when you listen you're able to mitigate it there than having to deal with an issue 20 years later maybe when they've been in alcoholism or they've been depressed or they've just been having low self esteem so they're not living out to be who they were created to be so listen more would be my kick take out thank you esther thank you christy and thank you so much for sharing these pointers i know parents out there will find it very useful mm -hmm. and as usual it's a pleasure hosting you on this show it's always a pleasure to empower today's parents thank you for coming thank you too and that's it for today's episode. On today's show, we were talking about favoritism. I hope you found the pointers that were shared by Esther to be insightful and useful to you. And now that we know better, let's see how we can do better, talk less, and listen more. And parent our kids as individuals rather than collectively. I know we are doing the best that we can, and let's continue doing the best that we can. In today's show, we were hosted at Little Cribs, the home of exciting, durable and affordable kids furniture. I have been your host, Christine Casina, and if you're looking for parenting resources, go to www.supermamas.co.ke. See you next time.